Pamela Newman Hupp, aka Pam Hupp, grew up in a Catholic household in Dalewood, Missouri. During her high school days, she was a likable, fun-loving cheerleader and apparently boy crazy. Pam captured the heart of a boy who wasn't just athletic, but also a member of the National Honor Society. Seems like she would have a great future ahead of her, right? Not quite. You see, Pam ended up marrying her boyfriend when she got pregnant three months after senior prom. Understandably, she resented her new life. Instead of studying in college like her classmates, she set up a home in a cheap apartment. Six years later, the marriage ended. Later on, she married Mark Hupp, a baseball player turned carpenter. Together with Pam, they hustled by flipping houses to earn profit. The thing about Pam is that money made her tick. Instead of splurging on riches, she talked her cash into investments. Pam would go as far as underhanded tactics against anyone to earn money. When Pam caught wind of her daughter's plan to buy a foreclosed house, she underbid and snatched the house under her nose and flipped it. Pam's main gig was selling life insurance. During her time in the industry, she got fired twice for forging signatures. When she and Mark settled down in a fallen Missouri, she secured a job as an administrator in a state farm office, where she met a woman named Betsy Faria. Betsy Faria was a sweet, bubbly lady who was well-loved by her colleagues. People remembered her as someone who could light up a room with her smile. Pam was different, though. It's not that she's not likable. She's just quiet, mature, level-headed, and as her boss remarked, adept at office politics. Regardless, Pam and Betsy clicked and became best friends. However, they lost in touch for a couple of years. Unfortunately, in 2010, Betsy was diagnosed with breast cancer. Pam herself had issues of her own. After leaving State Farm, she had a couple of low-paying insurance jobs before she called it quits. Pam applied for disability, citing back, neck, and leg pains that rendered her unable to get to work. Strangely, she's been observed walking with ease, and she even held Zumba classes. Before we continue, let us know if you like what you see so far by giving us a thumbs up. Please consider subscribing, as it would really help a lot in making this channel grow. Thanks a lot! Let's dive back in, shall we? When Pam heard of Betsy's condition, she rushed in the aid of her friend. She stuck like glue to her friend, running errands and accompanying her to her chemotherapy sessions. Betsy's husband, Ross Ferrier, was grateful for Pam since he still had to work full-time. On December 22, 2011, Pam and Betsy did something unexpected. They went to a library and asked a librarian to bear witness to a signature. Betsy changed the sole beneficiary of a $150,000 life insurance policy from Ross to Pam. Five days later, on December 27, 2011, Pam drove Betsy home from a chemotherapy session and dropped her off at around 7 p.m., according to her. Meanwhile, Ross headed to a buddy's house, watched movies, and smoked weed with his friends. Later, he drove to Arby's, grabbed some food, and headed home. He spotted something on the living room floor upon entering the house, prompting him to call 911. The address where you need this to come. One, 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 one thirty, see Mac. I want to kill herself. She's, she's, she's on the floor. Oh my God, God. Okay, just take a couple deep breaths for me. <laughs> Betsy's lifeless body was lying on the floor, with the wrists slashed open and a kitchen knife sticking out from her throat. As we just heard from the recording, Ross thought her wife had killed herself. After all, she had attempted it earlier. The news of her worsening condition could have pushed her over the edge. However, examination revealed that she had been stabbed 55 times. Clearly, it wasn't just suicide. The police were suspicious of Ross. One of the officers noted that he had limited tears coming from his eyes. As the officer chatted with Ross, he spoke normally and even managed to laugh. The police also found his slippers stained with blood. In addition, 
Ross had also failed a polygraph test, indicating that he wasn't telling the truth. The police also interviewed the last person who had seen Betsy alive, Pam. She claimed that Betsy wanted to move with Ross into her mother's old house and that Betsy planned to talk to him about it on the evening of her death. Pam also alleged that Ross had a violent temper and that Betsy was afraid her husband would be angry. She also claimed Betsy had written her an email. Allegedly, Betsy described in the email how terrified she was of Ross and that he had once suffocated her with a pillow. A week after her wife's death, Ross was arrested and charged with first-degree murder and armed criminal action. Ross hired his cousin Joel Schwartz to be his lawyer. At a glance, he seemed unbeatable. When Ross made a 911 call at 9.40 p.m., responders arrived 10 minutes later. They concluded that Betsy could have been dead for at least an hour. Ross's friends, who were with him during the game night, claimed that he had been with them until 9 p.m. His Arby's receipt was also stamped at 9.09 p.m. Based on the timeline, he couldn't have committed the murder. And although Betsy's blood was present in Ross's slippers, his clothes didn't have a single trace of blood. Ross didn't seem likely to be Betsy's killer. The most suspicious character here is Pam. To begin with, she had no alibi. Plus, based on the timeline, she's the only one who could have done it. Cell phone records showed that she was still within the vicinity of Betsy's house 30 minutes after she had dropped her off. Also, the murder was very timely. Being four days after she became a beneficiary of Betsy's life insurance, initially, Pam claimed that Betsy had asked her to give the money to her daughters when they got older. But in a later deposition, she said her friend had wanted her to keep the money all for herself. In addition, she had given inconsistent statements during the investigations. More likely than not, Pam was the killer. However, the prosecution thought otherwise. Pam's attorney, Leia Aske, rebutted that Ross's friends could have colluded with him and provided a false alibi. One of them could have dropped off Arby's for the receipt instead of him. She theorized that Ross could have murdered Betsy naked, hence the lack of blood in his clothes. The only proof against Ross was the bloodied slipper. Unfortunately for Ross, his rock-solid alibi crumbled to bits. The trial judge, Chris Manny Mayer, prohibited Swartz from presenting evidence that implicated Pam as a suspect, as the prosecutor had allegedly proved that she wasn't involved. In other words, he couldn't bring up Pam's motive as a beneficiary or her evidence that Pam's phone was near Betsy's residence around the time of the murder. On November 21, 2013, Ross Ferrier got convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole. In a nutshell, Ross was found guilty based on nothing but theories and a bloodied slipper. While irrefutable evidence pointed out otherwise, the judge dumped it in a garbage can and pinned everything on him. Truth be told, there are holes in his investigation. Ross had been up for 32 hours when he took the polygraph test, which wasn't standard procedure. Also, there wasn't any video recording of the test itself, as the camera was said to be not working. As for Pam, she agreed to undergo test but mentioned her head injuries. Instead of getting a doctor's clearance as the police had advised, she asked her doctor to write a letter stating she couldn't undergo the test due to her medical condition. However, her doctor told Schwartz that nothing about her condition would prevent her from telling the truth. Also, the police claimed that their test for the presence of blood in the crime scene showed signs of blood cleanup but the images weren't developed due to a camera malfunction. However, in 2014, Swartz received 132 photographs of the crime scene from Leia Askey's office. These images weren't shown during the trial. Moreover, Askey was allegedly in a romantic relationship with Mike Lang, the captain of investigations during that time. 
While the issue didn't get investigated, who knows, Lang could have twisted the investigation to ask Kay's favor. Sadly, Ross's imprisonment wasn't the only predicament. Ross's daughters were convinced that their dad had murdered their mom, rendering their family broken. However, this is not the last we'll hear about Ross. Meanwhile, Pam Hop got away $150,000 richer thanks to a lousy investigation and her sheer cunning. And yet, this is not the only time she would get involved in a murder case. Would this woman ever run out of luck? All I can tell you is that her story's far from over. Watch out for part two of the unimaginable, infamous case of Pam Hop. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and turn on the notifications to get front row seats to watch Canon's mind-blowing videos. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.